Um, okay, of course, it's an absolute honor and a pleasure to be here, uh, to be able to talk with you. Um, and so I, I want to focus on this, uh, well, I want to talk about the future, one of the future avenues in our field, and that is measuring gravitational waves from the birth of the universe and, uh, the, and, in 10 years. And the exclamation point is because it's really, really cool, and it's just, it's fun to do, and if we do it, it'll be huge. And the question mark is, we don't know if they exist at measurable levels, okay? So this is, this is what we're going after. Okay, so what's, what's this picture? Uh, this background map is a map of the sky, of the temperature fluctuations uh, in the sky. And from the, and you can think of it, that's flat. Here's a, here's a round version. And with the galaxy in it, the galaxy's been removed from that. From the reddest red to the bluest blue there is about 400 millionths of a degree centigrade. So those are the fluctuation levels that we measure. And when we think about that, when we just look at that, this is, you can think of it as a heat map of, of the universe that tells us about the strength of gravity over the universe. And we think about those, that model pattern as an impression of quantum fluctuations right from the birth of the universe. So that is quantum mechanics lit, writ large across the sky, say, by this process um, called inflation. OK, so what is gravitational wave? If, if you were here last year, I'm sure you, you heard a lot about them. And it's this, this propagation uh, at the speed of light through space-time. And I'm just going to limit, uh, when we talk about it, we'll just limit ourselves to the spatial part. So what, what happens? So, so that, those arrows are, are supposed to give you the picture that if a gravitational wave is propagating that way, it squeezes space this way, expands it this way, and a half a cycle later, it squeezes it this way and expands it this way, and then it goes on like that. And so how do we quantify that? The way we quantify that, and this is our my prop number one, is, uh, is with a strain. So, so what is a strain? You know, it's not, a, it's not psychology or anything like that. It's, a strain is if, and this is roughly a meter stick, a strain would be in the, say, the squeezing of space this way. If, this, if we squeeze this meter stick by one centimeter, right, that would be 1% and we'd say the strain is 1%. It's the change in length over length, okay? So keep that in, keep that in mind. So it squeezes it this way and expands it this way, and one centimeter is a strain of 1%, or 0.01. And the way we, we quantify that, uh, so we use, a, we use H. So what LIGO discovered last year, or two years ago, was two in-spiraling black holes, okay? Those in-spiraling black holes produce gravitational waves, and the strain that they produced uh, was 0.20 zeros and a 1, 10 to the minus 21. Okay, and that corresponds to a difference of about one human hair between us and the nearest star system, Alpha Centauri. Tiny. I mean, it's just it's a testament to the incredible, the, it, how incredible LIGO is as, as an instrument. And the waves that led to that oscillated, that, that oscillation that I tried to uh, give you an image of was about 100 times a second. OK, so what are we after? We, we are after gravitational waves uh, produced from the extraordinary densities at the birth of the universe. Right? When it's back, it was much more compact and hot. Their strains could be as large as a part in 100,000, right? Next to what, we, what LIGO measured, these are huge, right? These are, they're, they're enormous. The oscillation frequency, though, is roughly, very roughly, sort of 10 cycles in the age of the universe, okay? So we, these, we, these, are, if they, we, these are really, they're, they're fixed on the sky. And if, if we detected them, 
it would, and we will detect them in the microwave if we can. We'll see them in the microwave background. I'll get to that in a minute. They would provide us a connection between the quantum world, the same world that gave rise to all the fluctuations we see now, and gravitation, which would be amazing. Uh, certainly test for cosmology and you know, a link between, if you will, Einstein and Bohr that we have been searching for in physics for 100 years. Okay, so let me, uh, uh, let me uh, tell you, show you what it is that we actually look for. So this is, uh, this is a video made by uh, uh, a student, he's now a sophomore, Riley Bova. And uh, when it starts, it's a picture, it'll start out in our galaxy, our galaxy is about 100 billion stars. And it's, we're about two-thirds of the way out from it, 25,000 light years to the center of our galaxy. And then it's going to zoom out. Can you, uh, can you start the video? And the music, if it comes through. Ah, it's Rachmaninoff. All right. <laughs> and so, see, here we start off in the galaxy. And I want to give you a sense of the scales and distances that we, that we measure. So there's home. <laughs> I think it's centered on Stanford there. So. <laughs> okay, so those objects right there, these are some of the things we measured with our telescope. Those are, those are groups of roughly a thousand of our galaxies. Okay, so take a thousand times a hundred billion and put them there and, and that's what we see. And you can see how far away they are. Those are called clusters of galaxies. And Here we go, you see you start to get out, oh, up, up near a billion light years, right? Closing about, we're seeing out to a billion light years. The blue ones are from the Planck satellite, the red ones are from an experiment that we do. Actually, the LIGO source was about uh, a billion, 1.2 billion light years away. And you'll see we zoom out, telescopes are like time machines. As we look out, we look back, we keep looking out much further than those fixed objects we can see, and we look out to the cosmic microwave background, this sphere. Okay, here's my... So what are we looking for? What we're looking for, is, and you can see it's embedded in this black space, and, and we really think of it like that. These are gravitational waves that pervade space at scales you know, larger than our observable universes, right? This is set by the age of the universe times the speed of light. And, the str and what these do, that same strain, if you will, these squeeze and expand the universe, the observable universe. And they're not all the so whole size of the beach ball, but they can, be, you know, they can be like dimples in the beach ball, a fraction of it. Okay, so that's what we're, and, and that's what we're looking for. And what, that, what they do, and the new signature, is they cause, they produce a characteristic pattern of polarization in this image. And so we're measuring the sky, not in temperature, as you saw before, but we're measuring the sky with, uh, if you will, polarized sunglasses for the microwave background. Right, so that means if you had polarized sunglasses and you looked at the sky and you turned them, it would look different. Okay, you hold, you take your glasses off, you know, you turn them and it looks different. Okay, so we're looking for that, but we're doing it in microwaves. Okay, so, so, uh, so how do we do it? Here's another, uh, if you can click this video. So this is, uh, um, uh, this is we, we have a, a set of telescopes, actually the, the group at Stanford, uh, Chalin Kuo's group is doing this at the South Pole. There's another set of, of telescopes in Chile. This is now led up by my colleague Suzanne Staggs at Princeton and Mark Devlin at Penn. And so this is at 17,000 feet in, in northern Chile. And we, we build these telescopes and you'll see there's a, there's a community of them. And we have turned, uh, you can see the, the far one there, actually you probably heard Chuck Bennett earlier and Toby Marriage are working on that one and another group at Berkeley and San Diego are working on the one off to the left. And, and we're searching for this polarized signature in, this, in the sky. So, and then, and very recently Jim and Marilyn Simons have, have just have given us a, 
uh, were very generous and uh, given us uh, funds to, to expand this whole effort and build the whole infrastructure up there. So in 10 years, when, you know, when we found these and someone comes back and gives a talk, right, you'll, you'll see a much larger, uh, um, you'll, see, you'll see a larger set up there. Okay, so, uh, so how do we actually do this? What's involved? And, and what we, as I said, we were, looking, we were looking for this polarized signature. And when we did, so WMAP, when, when we did that, we had, we of course did it from a satellite, and we, we did it with, with uh, roughly 40 detectors. And this gives you an advance, 40 detectors at, at uh, in round numbers, 100 degrees above absolute zero. We're now working with thousands of detectors. This is how much things have evolved since not too long ago. We're now working at thousands, with thousands of detectors cooled to 100 millionths of a degree C above absolute zero. These massive arrays. And, and we're building up to look at the sky in 20, 40,000 detectors all at once. And, and to search for this characteristic pattern. And there's just, I'm just showing you a, a, a few pictures there. On the bottom is a sort of a typical uh, uh, detector system size and uh, uh, just, just typical cryostats. So this is what we build. It's a lot of fun. Um, and, and there are a lot of groups around the world doing it. And so what is it then that we, we're, we want to measure? Again, this is a, this is a simulation uh, by uh, Brian Keaton and colleagues. And it has in, in a, a zoom in, so this is uh, uh, roughly 400, squ 400 square degrees, as you can see. This is uh, in, the, in the background there, in the, the red and the blue, are the temperature variations. And so their characteristic uh, if you will, scale of fluctuation is about 100 millionths of a degree C. The polarization, this one form of the polarization, we've already measured well, and, and measured well. Uh, we measured it with WMAP. Uh, we've measured it on the ground. Um, and and it's, it's roughly a 20th of that in, in magnitude. So we're measuring that really well. We've even measured a, another form of the polarization, that's roughly a factor of 10 smaller than that. So, I mean, you can look at the numbers. This is, this is now, you know, we're measuring, we're measuring characteristic temperatures on the sky measured in hundreds of nanokelvin, right, from an Earth that's in 300 Kelvin. So you, it gives you an idea of the challenges in doing these measurements. And we know, and, and actually uh, it's Chow Lin's group has the best limit on this, we know that this gravitational wave signature and polarization, which is a very particular characteristic signature, has to be less than something like 90 nanokelvin. So in the next, it, it should be from just looking at all of our numbers, in the next decade, roughly, we should be pushing that down a factor of 10. Okay? So that's our, that's our goal. It's really exciting. And... Uh, Stay tuned. <laughs> Good. <Yeah>. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Thank You're you. <laughs> All right. We have a question right here from Ed. Can we have a microphone really quick? Yep. It's being recorded, Ed. So the So if we don't find it in the ground in the next decade, how much better can we do with a dedicated satellite? That's a politically charged question. Um, I, I, would, I would argue that they are both, they're both really important. And a satellite, if the, just, just to uh, put this in two pieces. On the ground, we look at angular scales that are, are say, degree size, roughly. It's very hard to measure across the whole sky. A satellite, what's so beautiful about a satellite is you can, you can measure the whole sky. And 
I would say if, uh, if, if they aren't found on the ground or they're not hints, the motivation, in I'd say a decade, the motivation is, is less. And it also depends on how well we can do, right? If we run into some fundamental limit and we can say, no, we have a limit because of, we don't have enough frequency channels, say, to measure the foregrounds, the dust and the synchrotron in our galaxy, we have to peer through that. If we don't have enough channels, we, it, it might just tell us, no, you have to go to space to get the frequency coverage. It could be something like that. So I'd say we will know in 10 years whether we absolutely need one to go to the next level. Um, but I certainly right now, you want to absolutely develop both of them. They're, they're sort of complementary. Is that? Well, maybe I can try a different version of the question. Thank you. <laughs> Um, models of satellites um, put at a factor of, in the tensor to scalar ratio, a factor of about 100 improvement of where we are now, both in space and on the ground. I should say, I'd also think if you did this on the ground and you saw a signal, you would, uh, you would uh, abs in that case, you would absolutely want to go to space because the measurements you can make from space are are so precise. It's because you can control the environment of your spacecraft so well. I'd say if there were a hint of it, you'd absolutely go to space, and otherwise it's a matter of timing. Perfect. We have a question in the back here. Yeah. Now that the Simons money has all of the teams cooperating as opposed to competing, mm -hmm. is there something you can okay. do with the multiple instruments that you're going to have um, on the sites that you could not have done with just a single one. Yes, so, so what, what we're about to run into is, is so far we've, um, the, the teams have just been able to measure the polarization, which is, which is great. And pretty soon, that, the signal we're after will start to be confused with what's called lensing B modes as opposed to primordial B modes. Right, the primordial B modes are the ones that would say come out of the, of the Big Bang. The lensing B modes are just pro produced from, uh, sorry for all this E mode, B mode stuff, right? The, the, lensing, the lensing B modes are produced by gravitational lensing of the E mode signal. Okay, so we're just about at the level where we have to clean that out. To clean that out, you want a higher resolution instrument. So, so the union is you use a high resolution instrument in combination with a low resolution instrument. The low resolution instrument measures the core signal we're after. The high resolution instrument cleans out the lensing. Okay? Another way, another complementary way is these are, these are hard measurements. I would never believe the result from one group, right? And you shouldn't. These are, these are hard. We work at the limits of noise. You, you need confirmation. You need someone else and then, and to, uh, and, and then even, even amongst groups, we can divide it up by frequencies, right? Because these are going to be measurements that were taking place over half a decade or a decade. And, and you don't want to, you know, it's better to distribute the load. You don't want one group doing everything, so we can split things up. So mul there are multiple ways to work together, and we're all buddies up there, right? We'll figure it out, and, and, uh, and we'll rely on our competition to keep us honest, right? So. Let me perhaps ask one uh, quick question. You, you were mentioning you had 40 detectors <laughs> with WMAP, yeah. right? And we were talking about hundreds of thousands of them now. Um, yeah, can I that. get you just to reflect on this a little bit <laughs> of how we get there in the next few years? Yeah, no, it's just, um, you know, this feel, this, we've, you saw that advance in just in the, in the pushing down of the level of these fluctuations. And it's all driven by these, you know, technology development and actually driven by people in the field trying to improve the detectors because we just, we can learn so much. I mean, this is just one, I mean, this is just one of the things we can learn, right? We, along the way, we should be able to determine the sum of neutrino masses. We'll put new limits on the, on the number of relativistic species in the universe, right? There are just tons and tons of things you can do. So it's really exciting and it's just driven this incredible technological development. And part of that is these detectors. The ones we use come out of NIST. Um, 
there's, uh, there's a group at Stanford gearing up to build another one. Actually, the, the, the father of the detectors we use is uh, Kent Irwin, who's here. Uh, there's another group at Argonne. There's a group at Goddard Space Flight Center doing them. There's a group at JPL. And there's a group at Berkeley. Right? And it's, take, it's going to take everyone to go from now we have a few thousand, 3,000, and we want to up that a factor of order 10. And that'll be you know, on, on this time scale. Wonderful. All right, let's thank uh, Lyman and all the speakers of this morning's session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.